Hey, thanks for joining us online today. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We hope you enjoy this message. So today's message is uh, about something that's very near and dear to my heart, something that I believe has changed my life, it's helped to shape our marriage, and it's uh, taken my faith to the next level. But before we get into that, I just want to show you something that I think will help demonstrate today's theme. And some of us, when we pack for a trip, this is what our suitcases look like. Some of you are getting anxiety just looking at this. Others of you are like, what? What's the big deal? Some of you, when you pack for a suitcase, you just bundle everything up, you stuff it in. There's no rhyme or reason to how you do it. And chances are, if your suitcase looks like this, then if we were to look at the backseat of your car right now, it would probably look pretty similar to this. Chances are, if your suitcase looks like this, your garage is pretty similar, your closet is probably like this, and your drawers and your dresser are just stuffed with clothes. And that's okay, God made us all different. But some of us, when we pack for a trip, you pack... A little bit more like this. Now, I, this is how I pack. I love these little storage cubes that you can roll up your shirts. And I roll up my shirts because I, I Googled the most efficient way to pack. And this is what Google taught me to do. And if you don't believe me, ask our youth pastor, Peter. We went to Florida last year, and he was making fun of me because of my storage cubes and the fact that I ironed all my shirts as soon as I got to the hotel. Now, some of us, we, we pack like this. And if your suitcase looks like this, chances are if we looked at the back seat of your car right now, there would be nothing there. If we looked at your closet, it would be organized, organized by uh, the types of shirts or whatever. If we looked at your desk or your office at work, chances are it would be clean. And if you're like me, I, I came in focus until I've cleared off my desk and changed my garbage can, then I'm ready for my day. See, some of us, we pack like this, some we pack like this, and honestly, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's okay for your suitcase to look like this. It's okay for your garage and your closet to look like this, but I think we can all agree that it's, it's not okay for our lives to look like this. It's not okay for our finances to look like this, for our relationships and for our schedules to look like this. See, to me, it's funny when somebody packs like this, but you know what? It's not funny when you see a young couple whose finances look like this, where they're living on 100% of their income, and it's like as if one more bill comes in, they're just going to bust at the seams. It's no fun to watch a family's schedule looks like this, where they have so much activities packed into their schedule, that, and they're doing so much stuff that they're not even enjoying the stuff that they're doing any longer. See, I, I think we can all agree, whether we're a Christian or not, that life is just better with breathing room. Life is just better. We can enjoy life better. And I want to talk today about this concept of breathing room and why I believe that this is important to God. I want to show you an example in Scripture where I believe that God teaches for us to live with breathing room in certain areas of our lives. So to get us all on the same page, here's the definition of breathing room. And you can fill this in in your message notes. Is Breathing room is the space between our current pace and our limits. Space between our current pace and our limits. Uh, breathing room is you're not stressed out when you're driving to work because you left 10 minutes early. So if you hit a couple extra red lights, it's not a big deal. Uh, breathing room is when you're living on 70% of your income. So if your car breaks down, the only stress that you feel is where is my checkbook? Because you can just pay cash for it. Breathing room is the, the space between our current pace and our limits. How much we make and how much we spend. How much time we have in the day and what is packed in our calendars. Now, we all have different limits, right? Every single one, you may have three times the capacity that I have, but every single one of us, we have limits in life. And if you think of the, the RPM gauge, and I, I said in the first service that it's rotations per minute, and I, uh, actually three girls came up to me and corrected me. It is, um, now I'm forgetting again. R yeah, ro what? Revolutions per minute. So I have no idea what I'm talking, I should have found another example. Anyways, 
This tells you how fast your engine's moving, I think. And every single one of us, we have this red line, and on your RPM gauge, if you look at it, you have a red line, and that is basically telling you what the limit of your car is. Now, every once in a while, if the needle hits the red line, it's okay. It's not a big deal if every, occasionally the needle hits the red line. But if you drove all the way to church this morning with your needle on the red line, what would happen? Your car would overheat or you would break down. And so often we live our lives, we let culture determine what that red line is, and we live our lives right at the limit until something drastic happens. Until maybe a spouse leaves, a a relationship is ruined, or uh, we fall apart financially. We may even end up in the hospital because we've been living on the edge for so long. I think we can all agree that life is better with breathing room. See, when we have none, and you can fill these in, and this is nothing new, we all know this. When we have no breathing room or not enough of it, uh, our stress goes up. I mean, think about the last time you were running late and you hit one more red light. Your, your heartbeat goes up. You're just getting a little bit more stressed out, especially if it's something important that you're running late to. Or think about the last time that your family was strapped financially. You had just enough money to pay the bills and put a few groceries in the pantry, and then one more bill comes in. I mean, we all know that feeling. So our stress goes up. Uh, the next thing that happens is our focus narrows. It narrows in on that thing that we have the least amount of breathing room, Right? Uh, I'll give you a a personal example and actually a recent example. Uh, So when I write a message for a Sunday morning, uh, I'm usually at least one week early, usually two to three weeks early, though. I like to be way out ahead and give myself a lot of breathing room in my preparation. But I'll be honest with you, this week, it was not the case. I finished this message on Wednesday uh, because two weeks ago, my wife and I, we celebrated our uh, seven-year anniversary. So we were out of town, and I had the whole week off. Uh, Last week, when I intended to do my message, I was catching up from my week off the whole week, and I I barely got any of it done. And then Monday and Tuesday of this week, uh, I I used a couple more days off for the holiday. And I have to tell you, when I was golfing on Monday with my friends, I enjoyed it about 90%. Because my other 10% begins to focus in on the fact that I was running out of breathing room. I was running out of margin with my preparation. Tuesday, I'm watching the fireworks. And while I'm enjoying the fireworks with my family, in the back of my mind is the fact that, oh my goodness, I have to finish my message tomorrow morning. I am running behind. And I'm not kidding you. Tuesday night, I had a dream that I came to church and only half my message was done. And I had a wing the second half. Now, as, as I'm running out of breathing room, my focus is narrowing and narrowing. Imagine if I didn't finish it until last night. How would my conversations be? I, I wouldn't be there very much. I would be so focused on the fact and so stressed out on the fact that I was behind that my conversations would have suffered. My, uh, I wouldn't have been a, as good of a husband over the past few days. Our focus narrows when we're stressed out, when we live on 100% of our income. What are we thinking about all of the time? We're thinking about money. What are we going to do to make more money? How can we cut back? You know who doesn't think about money too often? People who have a lot of breathing room. People who have a lot of margin. Now, of course, there's times and there's seasons where we have to be hyper-focused in a certain area. But if we live our lives at that red line, if we live our lives at the limit, eventually something will happen. Eventually it's going to be at the expense of something more important. So the third one is this, is that our relationships suffer. Mom, you're always on the phone. Dad, you always miss my recital. All you guys talk about is money. We're doing a lot of stuff, but we're not enjoying the stuff that we're doing. Our stress goes up, our focus narrows, and our relationships suffer. I recently uh, had breakfast with a friend of mine, and he was telling me this story about years and years ago that uh, he, he was working a lot of hours, and on top of that, he had a long commute to work every day, and he, he was just doing it to provide for his family. And one day on his ride to work, his, he was talking to his wife, and his wife, wife said to him, I'm beginning to, f- you've been working so many hours that I'm beginning to feel like I know what a single mom goes through. And in that moment, he, he said he pulled over and he, was, he broke down in tears. And he decided in that moment that he had to make some changes. He had to incorporate some more breathing room into his life. And he did that. And if he were up here, he would say, it's absolutely worth it. Is he making as much money as he used to? Probably not. But he would say it's worth it because he, can now, he now has the breathing room to focus on the things that matter most. Now, I know a lot of us would say, you know, it's, it's just the industry I'm in. If you understand the business or the business I own or the farm that I own, you would understand why I don't have breathing room. And that may be part of it. 
Some of you might say it's just a season of life I'm in. It's like there's nothing I can do about it, kids. I have all this stuff going on, and that might be part of it. Some of you would be honest and say, you know, it's just a lack of discipline, Brian. I, I know that I can make some changes, but I'm just not a disciplined person, and that also might be part of it. But I want to talk for just a little bit about what I think could be the root of the problem. The thing that drives our schedules and our finances and our relationships to look like this, with no breathing room whatsoever, and that thing is fear. In fact, if, if I asked you, if your schedule looked like this, and I asked you, why don't you just remove some of that stuff and create some more breathing room, you might actually start the sentence out with, I'm afraid if I do that, dot, dot, dot. I'm, a, I'm afraid if I work less, dot, dot, dot. I'm, a, I'm afraid if I take some things off my plate, if I cut back financially, dot, dot, dot. See, we we fear things like missing out. We, we pack our schedules with so much out of the fear of missing out that we end up missing out on peace. We trade peace for prosperity or peace for progress. We do this with our kids as well. I mean, think about it. Some of our kids, they're in 15 different sports and leagues, and we do this out of a, a good place. I mean, we want to give our kids every single opportunity, but too often it's at the expense of what we would say matters most, like real quality time with our kids. Or, or time going to church with our kids. I mean, uh, so, so often we wonder why is there less and less young people in the church? And I, I'm talking about the church in America, not this church. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the, the methods that some churches are using. But could it be that we've, we've taught our kids that church isn't really a priority? That as soon as the beach opens or the weather gets nice or another uh, sport starts, that church kind of falls to the secondary? See, when we live without breathing room, we, we tend to, our focus narrows on that thing, and we tend to ignore the things that we would admit matter most to us. So we fear missing out. Another thing is we fear falling behind. And I get this one completely because we live in a culture that rewards workaholics. I mean, think about it. If you work 60 or 70 or even 80 hours a week, what's going to happen? You're going to make more money, right? You're going to probably get another promotion. You're going to, you might get recognized at work. You may even get a trophy, you know where you don't get a trophy? Making it home every single night for dinner. You, you don't get extra money for being with your kids and spending quality time. You don't get promoted for stuff like that. And I, I think a lot of it, it comes back to this, this idea that we compare ourselves to other people and we see what others are driving and golf clubs that others have and the vacations that others take and the houses others live in. And we feel like we're falling behind and we're competing with other people. Like, why do we do that to ourselves? So I, I believe that this idea of breathing room, I believe it matters to God. And I, I want to show you just one example in Scripture that, that shows this, that, that breathing room matters to God. And this example is, uh, it's about the nation of Israel. And to give you a little bit of background where the story picks up, so the nation of Israel for hundreds of years, I'm talking generations and generations and generations, they're in slavery in Egypt. Um, it's about one to two million people that are in slavery in Egypt. And uh, you probably heard the story of Moses and how God uses Moses to free the people from Egypt. And now they're essentially a new country, a new society. For the first time in hundreds of years, they're no longer under slave law. They're under their own government. And God decides that he needs to give the people some laws so they can kind of create their own country and their own society. And since the beginning, God, he built breathing room into these laws. And I, I just want to talk about one thing, hone in on one, uh, one of the laws today, and that is the Sabbath. As many of you know, that made uh, God's top ten, the Ten Commandments. And it's found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. It says, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Now, we get this. We get this here in America. Now, we, we don't always do a great job following it, and we'll get to that in a second, but we get the concept of a day off. Most of us in our jobs, we get at least a day off. Many of us, we get two days off, double Sabbath. We get the whole weekend off. But you got to understand, for Israel, this was a brand new idea because for hundreds and hundreds of years, all they knew was slavery. And when you were a slave in Egypt, you didn't get a day off. This was a whole new idea. If you got, there was no sick days as a slave. If you got sick, you either worked through it or you died trying. So not only was this a new idea for Israel, but it was a dangerous idea because this was pre-refrigeration. Israel had no infrastructure, no economy at this point. They had to work every single day to provide food and shelter and clothes just to survive another day. I mean, we think we're busy, but we didn't have to milk a cow this morning for our milk. 
Now, I understand that this is Akron, and probably half of you milked an animal this morning. But you probably also had some food in your pantry as well. If you built your house, it wasn't out of necessarily a need. You built it out of materials you found at Home Depot or Guy's Lumber. You didn't have to go into the wilderness to get the material for your tent. You see, the Sabbath taught the people to trust God. They, they had no choice but to trust God. It was a dangerous thing. It was a new idea for them. And by the time Jesus came around, the, the Pharisees had taken every law that God had given them. They'd taken it way to the extreme. But Jesus said something profound about the Sabbath. He says this in Mark 2, 27. He said, the Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. See, the Sabbath was a gift because God understands how we're wired. He understands that we work best and we live best with breathing room. So my question for this morning is, are you really practicing the Sabbath? Which it simply means abstaining from work. And if not, why not? What's preventing you from experiencing the gift of the Sabbath? See, I, I believe when we, when we practice this, three things will happen, and they're the opposite of the earlier points. Our stress level goes down, our focus can broaden to the things that matter most, and our relationships get better. I'm, I'm not talking about a half day off. I'm not talking about an evening off, but an entire day, one day a week where we abstain from work. Now, you might be wondering what a real Sabbath looks like, because again, most of us, we get a day off. We get a couple days off, maybe. But I love what Eugene Peterson, who he wrote the message translation of the Bible, which is a paraphrased translation, and just an incredible author. He said his two rules for the Sabbath are to play and to pray. So him and his wife, they've made it a priority that they set aside one day where they just do things that rejuvenate their soul. They do things that they enjoy doing together. And my, my wife and I, we've made this a priority over the last several years. And for us, usually it's Fridays, though this week is vacation Bible school, so it's going to be a Saturday for us this week. But we, we've been very uh, good about following the Sabbath. And on that day, we, we do things that we enjoy doing. We'll go out to eat. We'll, we'll do things that rejuvenate us, that bring us joy. We'll go for a walk together. I've shared this with you before, but I'll, I'll mow my lawn on a, on a Friday or a Sabbath, whatever that day is, but I won't weed whack because mowing the lawn is, that's enjoyable for me. Like I have a riding lawnmower. It's, I can just listen to music and be outside for a little bit, but weed whacking is a lot of work. So I don't do that on my Sabbath. See, we've, we've protected our Sabbath. Now, we're not legalistic about it. I mean, if you're in the hospital, I'll still visit you on a Friday. But we protect it. We try to do things that we enjoy, that bring us joy and bring us uh, energy. And we, we spend time with God in prayer and, and Scripture. Now, you might be thinking, that sounds great, but I just can't. If you understood what the industry I'm in, if you understood the business that I run, you would understand that it's just not possible for me. And I, I would ask, why not? And I would venture to guess that it comes back to fear. Fear of missing out. Maybe it's on potential profits. Maybe it's on whatever. Or fear of falling behind our competitors. Fear, fear of falling behind uh, from comparing ourselves to other people. I think it all comes back to fear. See, when Israel practiced the Sabbath, it taught them to trust God. They probably asked God, how will we survive if we can only work six days a week? How can we, as a nation of over a million people, survive if everyone takes a day off? And God said, trust me. God, how will I make enough money to support my family on, if I'm only working six days a week? God says, trust me. God, how will I run my business or whatever? How will I do that if I'm only able to work six days a week? God says, trust me. See, I believe the Sabbath can make us a better husband, a better wife, a better parent, a better friend. I believe it can make us a healthier person. And if we're a Christian, I believe this, it can take a, our faith to the next level. Because by doing something like this, what it's saying is I'm going to trust God in the gaps. If it's hard for you, if you're not doing it out of fear, this is saying I'm going to trust God in the gaps. See, I, I believe that God can do more with us in six days than we could ever dream of doing in seven Here's a real extreme example, but uh, Chick-fil-A is famously closed on Sundays, and it's almost irritating because we don't have one around here, and every time I seem to be in Pennsylvania or somewhere with a Chick-fil-A, it seems to be on a Sunday, and I pull into the driveway or the parking lot, and I realize it's a Sunday, and my heart just drops because I just want some Chick-fil-A. 
But since the beginning, since they first opened, they've always been closed on Sundays. And they did it for a couple of reasons, for uh, religious reasons, because they, they believed in the value of the Sabbath. And they also did it for practical reasons to take care of their employees. But you might be wondering, how on earth could Chick-fil-A, how could they compete with giants like McDonald's and Burger King and Pizza Hut and Panera and all these fast food giants in the country? Well, check this out. The top three, Burger King, per store every year sells $1.5 million in food. McDonald's, per year per store, sells $2.5 million. Chick-fil-A sells $3.1 million. They are by far the best-selling fast food company. Now, there's probably a ton of variables. I get that. But think about this for a second. By, sh- by shutting down on Sundays, by shutting down one day a week, it, it communicates to their employees that they're going to put their people before their profits. And when you believe that a company puts their people before the profits, what kind of employees does that attract? That attracts better employees, that, that helps the employees to be better employees. And when they're better employees, what happens to the customer service? Just goes to the next level. Now, have you ever been to a Chick-fil-A? Their food is pretty good, but it's still fast food, right? But their customer service is legendary. That is their bread and butter, no pun intended. That is what makes Chick-fil-A amazing. See, fear says work nonstop or you will fall behind or you will miss out. Faith trusts God in the gaps. Fear says spend everything and buy stuff so I don't fall behind. Faith trusts God in the gaps. So I want you to consider this morning three different areas in your life. Uh, The first one, what we talked the majority about today, time. Our calendars, our schedules, what does that look like? Do we have enough breathing room? The other one is finances, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that one next week. And then relationships. In the last couple verses for today, uh, Matthew 6.31, this is Jesus talking. He says, don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. Hey, what what would our lives look like if we really believed that? Would it be a little bit easier to take a day off and take that step of obedience and actually practice the Sabbath if we really believe that everything we need, God already knows and will provide for us. What would that do to our faith? So the last fill-in today is the first step in building breathing room into our lives is replacing fear with faith. It's a big difference. We, we live like this out of fear. And for a lot of us, this is going to take some faith might be scary. It might be like Israel. It might be dangerous, but it's an act of faith and an act of obedience. And then our memory verse for today, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So where do we need breathing room? Is it our calendars? If we're honest with ourselves, do our calendars look like this? Would a Sabbath, do you think a Sabbath could make you a better person, a better husband, better Christian? If it's our finances, and again, we'll talk about it more next week, but practicing the tithe, giving 10% to God, maybe saving 10% and living on 80 or 70% of our income instead, whatever it is for you, take a step in trusting God in the gaps. So we have two choices. We can let culture determine what our red line is and how often we're going to be there, if we're going to live like that, or we can trust God in the gaps and have a little bit of faith and build some breathing room into areas of our lives. You see, I I know men who didn't have time to invest in their marriage. And then the spouse one day had enough and left, and he eventually spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of time trying to save his marriage. And if he were up here today, he would tell you that he wished he would have spent those hours on the front end, but it took a crisis to get his attention. I know parents who, out of a good place, they work so hard to provide for their family and make money so they can put their kids in their best school and the best sports. And unfortunately, it was at the expense of real quality time with their kids until one of the kids just spiraled out of control. And then they spent hours and hours and hours and hundreds and hundreds of dollars trying to rescue their kid. And if they could go back in time, they would say, I wish I could invest those hours on the front end. But it took a crisis to get their attention. So this week, as I was preparing for the message, I I decided to ask a bunch of people, 
like 20, 30 people, the same question. And I sent them all the exact same text message. If you, at your current age, with all your experiences and knowledge and wisdom, if you could give yourself advice at the age of 25, what would you tell yourself? And the people I asked were mostly in their 50s or 60s, a few of them in their 40s. But these are some of the responses I got. And honestly, this was just for the message today, but some of the responses I got changed my life. I I wrote them down and I'm gonna keep them forever. And I just wanna share with you a few of what I got back. Some of them were things like, always try to be kind. Don't be afraid to take chances and trust that God will take care of you. I love this one, laugh more. Slow down. Put others first in every aspect of life. Focus more on pleasing God. This person says, God has a better plan for you than you could ever make up or create. Just trust him. Someone said, be patient. Another said, trust God. One person said, work less. And then this last one was, he would tell himself at 25 years old, he would say that 99.99% of everything you fear will never come to pass. Don't let fear control you. You know what answers I didn't get? I didn't get a single answer that said, I wish I would have worked more in my 20s. No one said, I wish I would have made more money. No one said, I wish I would have bought a better car. It was all about trusting God. It was all about spending time with family. It was all about the things that matter most. So where do you need more breathing room in life? Chances are you already know. This isn't one of those things you have to go reflect on for a while. Chances are you already know where you're lacking breathing room. Your focus is narrowed, your stress is up. Do something about it before your relationships begin to suffer. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for the story of Israel and God, how you taught them to trust you, how you taught them to replace fear with trust. And God, I ask that you would do that in our own lives. God, we live in a culture that just says, go, go, go. And I I ask that you help us to, to slow down. God, to to focus on our relationship with you and our relationship with others. God, help us to have breathing room in the areas that matter most. God, we love you and we thank you. And we pray this in your name. Amen.